So we, how would it be? Is it just a No, it has to have some. Oh, I see. You put something in it. Um, I already. This is the receipt. So how do I do it? Is it? Yes. No, no. No. That did it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is forward and this is backwards. backwards. Okay. Do you have something even before this? I think you did. Yeah, it was. Um, yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to do it. Uh, let me just. It's not happy. Uh, let's try this again. Okay, just <laughs> leave it and let it. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, the problem is, uh, can it can it detect it? Yeah. Can the receiver get it? Yeah. Um, can I? Can we put it over here so it's maybe a tad closer to me? Is that possible? I want to put this open. So that it's closed up with So that Yeah, if it could be here. Thank you. Oh. Um, where am I? It, it's, it should, why isn't it showing? Test. That's it. So let me just see if it if it goes. See if you can go further yeah. and then and then and then trigger it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can can you advance? No. Yes. Oh. Yes. Right, it's sluggish, but it looks like it's working. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Just leave it like that. That's fine. Yeah. Yes. Uh, best for this because I use my hand. Uh, do you have one that's Hello, testing, testing. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, please tell me if it's, um, remember last night it was making all the static? Is it making the static oh, now? Is it is working? So fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, that's the question. Um, could it go here? All right, uh, maybe I'll testing. Is it good? Can you hear? Maybe I'll just. Um, hello, testing, testing. 
I hope the people at UCL could hear me. Hello. Okay. All right. Um, to the, um, do you so want to mention? Who um, is in um, telling them that we are starting so that they oh. have to, to restart? Then um, I'm going to introduce you okay. to, so to both sides and, and, then, and then you can start. Make it very quick. Okay. Yeah. Yes, very quick. And um, also, uh, let me just um, put this. Uh, can, do you want to mention to the people at UCL that they have a copy now? Or, uh, oh, they don't have it yet. Um, I don't know. I think w I'll just tell them that we are okay. emailing. Okay. So, so, yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Oh. Good evening, um, everyone from Hong Kong, and good morning to our colleagues at UCL. Um, we are having, yes, we, we actually had a very nice, extremely stimulating two-hour pre-lecture symposium. And I feel very bad that actually um, we were not able to give them enough time for the discussion and the presentation, but, but this was really... Um, Fantastic, and it's a uh, great way for us to start this um, lecture this evening uh, with Professor uh, Laura M. Petito. And um, I would like to tell our colleagues at UCL that um, the set of slides um, in PDF format is on its way <laughs> to them by email. So um, once they get it, it, it's probably better for them to look at that. Um, file because the quality of the uh, image of the screen may not be good enough. And um, I don't want to make a long um, introduction. Uh, I think everyone here as well at UCL know Professor Petito and her fabulous work on, well, we knew, at least at Hong Kong U, because this is her third visit as Sin Kin, Distinguished Professor in Humanities. Um, we know, uh, we've heard a lot from her about her work on understanding children growth and development. But this time is fabulous because it's so exciting to have not only the science of learning but also robots, avatars, and more importantly how it's going to be translated um, for education. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Professor Petito. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you in the room today, and thank you to the scientists at UCL. Uh, really thrilling lectures, and look forward to discussing afterwards. And so I am here today as a representative of the Science of Learning Centers in the United States. You may know there are six Science of Learning Centers in the United States, and I'm the scientific director and the co-PI of one of them. And the Science of Learning Centers represent an enormous monetary contribution from the United States government. This was a very serious investment. It's amazing that it's already, uh, we're like 15 years into the discipline and about 10 years into the Science of Learning Centers. And already um, information is, uh, travels and changes at such a fast pace, we've already begun to enter the next generation of science of learning and educational neuroscience. So I'll uh, just um, uh, change my slides one moment. Uh, okay. Um, sorry, this isn't working. 
It seems to be frozen on the first slide. Um, no worries. I'll just see if we can get it going. All right. Um, and um, okay. So the science of learning is, as I said, uh, uh, the centers are about six years old. The science of learning is the study of human learning across the lifespan, and it has a sister discipline or a daughter discipline called educational neuroscience, and that focuses on the nature of learning in the developing child and the core, core knowledge that's important for a growing developing child. The two disciplines share uh, very much their methods. It's uh, mostly made up of cognitive neuroscientists, and we look do combinations of neuroimaging and behavioral studies, very important. And as I said, so much has happened already that we're already beginning to transfer into the next generation. So today I'm going to talk about the next steps and a new focus in the United States government um, on uh, smaller teams of high-risk science, and I'll explain what that is. Then I will uh, motivate one particular problem by looking at uh, some foundational questions that have guided a, uh, one particular initiative. And finally, I'll go in depth about one example in these, uh, an attempt to address uh, this newer uh, rendition of the science of learning, this newer endeavor and initiative in the United States on the science of learning. So, um, uh, the, in part one, next steps in high-risk science. So high-risk science is an, um, it's the uh, high risk because there are questions in science that have never been asked before, but they're low risk in that the teams of expertise are brought together and are highly likely to have an outcome. So this began by the United States, oh, sorry, um, this is, Okay, so um, as I said, as we were 10 years into the Science of Learning Centers in the United States, uh, in the 10th year, uh, uh, the United States government hired Faye Lamax Cook to be the new assistant director of the National Science Foundation. And on February 4th last year, 2015, she called us to an, a meeting, this is all the heads of the Science of Learning Centers, and said that she was breathless, she just came from the White House, and she said that there's a new in initiative and the president and the, uh, his cabinet would like focus on what they called big science, big data, and big impact. And this was um, uh, smaller teams of uh, technological, uh, smaller teams that bring together innovative technology and the integration of the technology to answer um, uh, big questions in science, to produce large amounts of data that can be shared across the world and that had big impact. And this specifically the impact is meaningful translation to society within the goals of educational neuroscience and the science of learning. And in particular, it also involved uh, an emphasis on the desire to have international collaborations, and Asia was particularly identified as the number one priority. So it's very interesting that you at, here at the University of Hong Kong are engaging in this very exciting uh, movement and program to, to launch in a solid way the science of learning, uh, because there's certainly uh, emphasis and excitement about it in the United States. So, um, uh, turning now to, uh, excuse me, um, so, sorry, this, um, the slides, uh, it's not working. So I will just stand here and manually advance. So, um, the, uh, the assistant director is directly over uh, Dr. Sue Samling and Tanya Karelsky. So immediately they began to s establish within the NSF system a, s a network of people who would be involved in the creation of um, uh, interdisciplinary teams and scientists 
Uh, number one, they would advance each individual, that each of the teams and their individual science commitments would advance the sciences that they were in. So the sciences that were being brought together had to have a fundamental roadblock over which they, the field had come to a, a wall and that in working together they can overcome that wall through the integrated uh, activities across the uh, labs to create new, that the union of these new smaller teams would create new branches of knowledge uh, in the science of learning and that they would produce far-reaching science of learning outcomes for the benefit of society. So immediately uh, a division within NSF was set up to uh, make a solicitation on this particular type of uh, science union. Uh, uh, following from that, the uh, private funding agencies uh, established similar priorities and within NSF, through the initiatives of Sue Sang Lim and Tanya Karelsky, they started uh, um, so what was solidified was the INSPIRE program. And uh, the INSPIRE program represents uh, integrated NSF support promoted, promoting interdisciplinary research and education, INSPIRE. And then uh, following that, uh, uh, I collected, uh, worked with a team of scientists and we put in a grant and we indeed got one of these awards. Um, and that will be the nature of the, the projects that I'll, I'll explain today. So um, uh, I'll turn to the first uh, part, which is the foundational problem. And in looking at the foundational problem, it's important to know that all of these projects have to be driven by questions in science. They're not just uh, cosmetic collections of teams. There has to be fundamental issues that we uh, hope to have the answers for. And so one of the fundamental issues is this. If you look at this visual scene, it has many components. There's a sun and a stream and lots of rich vegetation. But we're able to look at the visual scene and pull out and attend to very specific components of it. You, you can uh, turn away from the sun and look at the water and etc. You can differentially focus on that. So from this very infinite number of potential stimuli in this image, we can focus on finite elements in it. And similarly, human language is like that. Human language is a very complex signal and when a young baby is born, they have this very varied and continuously varying sound stream around them. And from that, they have to identify a small set of units from which it will form all the words and sentences in their native language. And we know that when a child is born, although they're very intelligent, n children are not speaking or perceiving the meanings of language at the moment of birth. But by 12 months old, the typically developing baby already has its f the fundamental elements of its phonological inventory. Most typically developing babies have produced the first word. They understand a variety of meanings. They're able to indicate with gestures and pointing a rich array of communicative functions. And in other words, from birth to 12 months, something has happened. What is it that's happened? This whole entire process occurs very rapidly. And some have called it the miracle of language acquisition because a child before our eyes goes from not having a certain capacity to having it. And the question is, what was the child born with? and what's in the environment that makes this extraordinary cocktail possible? What could the child possibly have come into the world with that might facilitate or aid them to discover this linguistic unit so quickly? If you looked at what the physical signal actually uh, looks like, imagine I was going to speak inside of a speech spectrogram. What you would just see is this, these bandwidths, and these bandwidths really represent spindles of air being hurled through the air. So the thing, we have the perception of having, of hearing words and sentences right now, but that's actually created by processes in the human brain. Literally the signal that's hitting your ear is just sound waves that are being hurled through the air through movements of my tongue and my mouth. 
So from this signal, again, constantly varying and very complex signal, the human child is going to extract out and discover a small set of sounds, roughly, m roughly around 40, 45 sounds, and, they, and that's going to comprise their phonetic inventory, the bits and pieces of sound from which they b will build the words and sentences across their life. This happens very quickly, as I said, and it is these small phonetic units from which they build and then having discovered the phonetic units in the constantly varying stream, they now have the unit over which they pe can begin to marry form and meaning, to begin to build the network of meanings that they will have. And this is again happening very early in life. This begins around 12 months. And then in the early emergent reader, the child's going to begin to use those phonetic that phonetic information, the phonological foundation that they formed in the first year and second year of life, and they're going to begin to use that to decode letters on the page, sounds and their language, and the meanings, en route to decoding meaning. And this is in the very early emergent reader. It's also a process that's occur, that occurs even in logographic languages that are not writing systems that are primarily based on sound. So you may say, well, that's an alphabetic language system in English. Perhaps a child will use more of the phonetic coding because of the, depend, the more of a mapping between the sound and the letter. But no, children at the early stages of entry in Chinese and in other logographic languages also recruit phonological information in the early mapping on route to meaning, um, early mapping of the sound to the logograph on, on route to meaning. All right. But what about um, children who are deaf? Is this, is this Phonological processing is the segmentation, something that's unique to sound. It is not unique to sound. So some of the findings that have uh, uh, come out of the literature is that young children who are deaf, exposed to sign language, and also have a densely packed linguistic signal, but this signal is densely packed and linguistic on the hands. So it's silent, yet the brain uses the identical segmentation and categorization processes and applies it over the hands and extracts out a phonological inventory. Now we see this in two ways. We see this in several ways. We see it in the early child, the deaf child on a maturational timetable who begins to produce phonological babbling around six months of age, just when a hearing child produces phonological babbling vocally. These children, uh, the uh, productions have the rhythmic, syllabic, and phonetic units that, they ha that they, we see in spoken language, but again, these are on the hands. If we turn to the adult brain, we see that this phonetic syllabic information, when processed by deaf people, is processed in tissue that historically had been viewed as sound processing tissue. It's not next to it or near it, it's the identical tissue. The identical superior temple gyrus, and in particular, the planum temporale in the superior temple gyrus, processes visual units on the hands that have the phonetic syllabic status in sign languages exactly the way spoken language phonetic syllabic units are processed in that tissue. So it's been uncontroversial that that tissue is responsible for the processing of sound for at least 125 years. What was controversial is whether or not it was something that was based on sound or was it based on the linguistic structure of natural language. And we now can answer that question that that tissue is responsible for very specific linguistic levels of analysis, not on modality. So it's very exciting findings, a convergence of structure across the hands and the tongue. And that leads to the, uh, a final quite dramatic observation. And that is um, how a young deaf child might acquire reading. So before we look at that, let's just take a moment at how a young hearing child acquires uh, early reading or achieves the task in the early uh, period of learning to read. 
um, we know that a hearing child, as I said before, recruits aspects of their sound system, the phonological sound system, and they map it to letters on the page en route to determining meaning from print. And so you have the print, the child might say k sounding it out, and go to, um, uh, and uh, en route to decoding the letters C, A, and T. And when we say that the child has sound phonology, we understand that to mean they have knowledge of the rhythmic temporal patterns that form um, uh, minimal contrast units uh, involving uh, uh, alternating units of an uh, opal, opal open oral uh, vocal tract to a closed oral, uh, oral track, uh, vocal tract. And um, we on the outside call that s uh, consonant vowel uh, syllable structure. We used to think that was exclusive to uh, properties of the mouth and the jaw, the raising and closing of the mouth that gave out the vocalic sound when you opened your mouth, and then the closed consonant sound when you closed it. But now we understand that that organization, that rhythmic open close open close syllabic nucleus is also produced out on the hands naturally in human development on uh, in young deaf children so what we see is that when a young deaf child uh, is reading we used to think that the deaf child was doomed to be a poor reader and doomed to acad academic failure that there was, uh, they, were, they would have to be poor readers for the rest of their life because they don't have access to sound. So a priori, they have to be at the level of poor readers. Um, recent discoveries in our Science of Learning Center in the United States, this is across 15 different labs and uh, across developments and uh, uh, neuroimaging studies of adults and a uh, variety of studies have uncovered that there is an abstract level of language organization called phonology that is built by the human brain even when it's hands. And uh, a young deaf child with early exposure, early exposure to sign language, learning language on the normal maturational timetable in sign as a hearing child learns in speech, their brains will build this phonological level of language organization. And when they go to read, they map units of the sign phonetic organization in sign language, units of the syllabic organization in sign language, and units uh, and the rhythmic um, segmentation of these units. And they, too, map it onto segments of letters that give rise to their access to meaning. So visual sign phonology is the rhythmic, temporal, phonetic, syllabic units on the hands that rather than close, open, close, open, involve hold, movement, hold, movement, hold, movement. And that is the syllabic unit on the hands and the syllabic unit on the tongue. And if to uh, see one uh, other example of it, in the human brain, the superior temporal gyrus is the tissue that's segmenting a linguistic stream based on the human capacity, the brain's biological capacity to segment and categorize the linguistic stream. It's done in the superior, it's accomplished in the superior temporal gyrus. And you can see it's sensitive to the undulating uh, patterns in a linguistic stream. One of the things the human species gets for free in that sensitivity is it's like this wish of sound comes in or this wish of visual in linguistic information comes in and it allows the child to segment chunk, chunk, chunk this linguistic stream and once they chunk it they can find the unit over which the child can then perform the frequency and distributional statistical analyses over the unit. This tissue is the answer to how the child gets the statistic the unit in the first place. You can see if you then just superimpose this graphic over, uh, uh, you can see the rhythmicity of how a child who's just tuned to the linguistic rhythmicity, the rhythmic undulating temporal patterns of natural language can pull out, a, if this was in a sentence, you can see that sensitivity would give the child that unit over which they can get, begin to map text house to the meaning house. 
right? And we know that young children do this naturally who are deaf and exposed to sign language. One of the interesting things is not so much the insight exclusively into one population, deaf children, but the insight that I'd like to suggest is it's really at a historic level. It has to do with the, the, uh, the conception that language and speech are fundamentally tied and that speech must be sound, language must be sound based in order to be a language. So at the grand level, the level of what it means to be human and what is human language, these types of studies laid bare that language and speech are separate and um, actually tore them apart and forced us to reconceptualize, reconceptualize what is language if it isn't exclusively tied to speech. But another thing it raised is that the human brain might facilitate the language acquisition process and one of the biological components that might contribute to the young 12-month-old even arriving at a phonetic inventory in the first place is that this brain tissue that's specifically sensitive to specific rhythmic temporal patterning on, at the core of natural language structure, that it's not modality, but it's the patterning of language that's key. So these are observations culled over decades of work they have implications for the nature of language, they have implications for the nature of the human brain, and how the brain contributes and kind of booster rockets the child into the relevant attentional space in early life to help them discover the units that are going to be vital for them to build a phonology and to build word meanings. And uh, obviously the uh, rest of language, the morphology and syntactic and semantic uh, components of language. But there's a couple of things about this amazing capacities that, the, that our brain has. It requires that human language must be, that children must be exposed to early, la to language early in life. These rhythmic temporal patterns that are at the nucleus of natural language structure, children must account encounter this in human life. One thing we know is that this superior temporal gyrus and the planum temporale on a very strict maturational timetable in early life. It's one of the most unforgiving swatches of brain tissue in natural language uh, acquisition. It's on uh, one of the things that uh, we've seen in many studies having to do with uh, the age of first language exposure and its predictability for language outcomes, the, la the age of bilingual exposure and the predictability for uh, bilingual language mastery is that early exposure is very important and very important for the segmentation abilities that get, let the child crack into the uh, structure and grammar of natural language. So, this, so early exposure to human language is very important. Another very important factor is that early social contingency, contingent interactions, a child being in a peaked arousal and attentional state where it's attending to the interaction and the linguistic information. The, uh, we heard earlier from Emily Ferran uh, questions about joint attention and visual regard. Uh, these are very important to occur in human language, uh, in typical development and very important that they occur early in life. In fact, it's like a booster rocket. These have temporal impact in early life. They don't have sustained impact. We don't need shared visual guard when you're 40. <laughs> you, you can talk to someone when they're not absolutely looking at you. But developmentally, there's a sensitive window and children benefit most optimally from experience with language if the experience is conveyed in a social, communicative, interactive context. And with that, should the child have this early exposure to the rhythmic patterns and the early social, uh, in, in an early socially contingent way, we know that it's predictive of uh, uh, higher reading, better vocabulary, uh, reading, and, and ultimately academic su success. It's highly predicted, predictive of uh, academic uh, and um, uh, school success.
So what are some of the challenges to the Nature's Imperative? One is that uh, we see vast numbers of children have minimal language input in early life. And um, we even heard before about the impact of low socioeconomic status on language uh, development and, uh, and many factors. Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, there are a variety of reasons. One, as we uh, um, heard, is that um, uh, low socioeconomic status could contribute to a child having minimal language input. Also, um, uh, late bilingual exposure in a child who needs to learn uh, a majority language other than their home language, late bilingual exposure could contribute to them having um, a, a minimal language input experience that then has a protective outcome on uh, their language competence in the target language. And then there's another group of children that have an extreme or an extreme example of minimal language uh, uh, input. And these are children who are born deaf, largely in hearing families, who have, not, beyond minimal language experience, they have no language input, uh, no usable uh, language input. They could be um, uh, profoundly deaf children who are um, slated for cochlear implants and the practice is to um, uh, prohibit any exposure to sign language in those early months and when the implant is uh, uh, finally, when the surgical procedure happens, they are uh, somewhere between 9 and 12 months of age but you can't tune the cochlear implant till about eight months later. So we're talking about children from birth to around eight months who have no systematic usable language input to in the, during the critical period when uh, there's a peak sensitivity to phonetic contrast. This is age six months to 14 months when the child still has an open capacity to um, discriminate the world's languages to which they could have been exposed and then it becomes uh, dramatically attenuated by around 14 months with regard to the universal sensitivity but they get an increased sensitivity in their native language. But these young deaf children, if you're going to get your first systematic language training at 18 months, have significantly uh, passed um, many of the developmental milestones that need to have happen be, so that they can experience natural language um, and natural language rhythmic patterns early in life. So this um, gives rise to the example that I wanted to uh, identify. Um, this is one example of how the science of learning questions can be answered through integrating technologies and behavioral measures that permit uh, new unprecedented views uh, into human learning. So um, this is um, to address this problem of uh, minimal language input in particularly in uh, young visual learners who have no exposure to natural language, usable, usable natural language in early life. We uh, drew together a team. Uh, this is uh, um, consistent consisted of a team of researchers at Gallaudet University um, in neuroimaging and eye tracking, uh, applied psychophysical, uh, from the field of applied psych psychophysical uh, studies. This is um, Professor Archangelo Merler, who does thermal infrared imaging. Um, uh, David Trom from the University of Southern California who does virtual human, uh, as particularly virtual human dialogue and conversation and robotics. Uh, Brian Scazzolati at Yale who um, makes uh, social ro robots, no longer robots that replace humans but robots that assist humans, socially assisted robots. And one of the things we did is to devise a, um, and you'll see why this is very high risk, this is uh, integration of uh, multiple uh, disciplines and technology not yet to have been uh, uh, devised. Um, we thought to create a robot that would be placed inside of a child's crib or beside a child's crib in um, uh, 
uh, in which it would be yoked to an avatar, uh, to a, a visual screen, and uh, in which avatars would produce uh, language samples uh, through the use of thermal imaging. The thermal imaging, and I'll go over these in a moment, the thermal imaging is, uh, sen um, is sensitive to emotional arousal in young children and attentiveness as, uh, and through basic experiments to yoke that with higher cognitive uh, states, we are going to um, introduce the capacity of the robot to discern when a child is looking and attentive and then to initiate the triggering of the language samples or when the child has ceased to be interested in attempting uh, and uh, attending. So um, uh, the uh, product, uh, the learning tool is called the Robot Avatar Thermal Enhanced Learning Tool or the RAVE and RAVE is going to make available components of language and one of the key scientific innovations here is we'll be using FNERS neuroimaging and thermal infrared imaging to uh, discern an index of when the child is socially con uh, aware, aware and attending to the linguistic samples and to identify an index of when a child, through this method, which I'll lay out in a moment, that when the child is socially uh, ready to learn, an index before the baby can even communicate with us, before the baby can produce language, to indicate uh, emotional attentive states in the child that indicates their attentive and ready to receive the information that we're going to give it. Um, the baby, uh, the baby's socially interacted gaze will trigger the robot and to produce nursery rhymes from a virtual human in sign with speech options uh, to be used by hearing children as well. All right, uh, so um, there's a lot of scientific challenges, so you'll get a sense of why this is considered so high risk. Um, the, one of the uh, fundamental components of this is um, some of the research uh, on the, uh, the cognitive neuroimaging research is going to uh, identify the rhythmic frequency units that are minimally, uh, that children or infants at particular ages, six months and ten months, are minimally uh, interested in. This will be included in the robot to be able to dif differentiate when a child is producing um, a baby signing that's linguistic versus when it's just waving its hands and not linguistic. We also have um, uh, basic science of with the cognitive and neural applied physiology studies, looking at babies' arousal to linguistic information in contrast to non-linguistic information to start uh, um, understanding uh, the, what is the prime unit that children are interested in, in the, being able to capture the um, rhythmicity of sign language that can be put into an avatar that can create language samples on the fly, we are going to be using uh, mocap rhythmic patterning of uh, signing that's then going to be um, built into the avatar. Let me show you some of the individual sciences and how this is going to be. Uh, I'll take it apart and then put it back together again. So the first uh, team uh, is my team at Gallaudet. And as I mentioned before, uh, we know that the rhythmic, uh, children are born with a rhythmic sensitivity to uh, minimal contrastive units. We still need to discover the precise rhythmic temporal frequency. The hypothesis is, is about a hertz, a hertz and a half. So we'll be doing a series of studies to crack the code as to what exactly that nucleus is. Let me show you on the next slide. Um, our experiments are going to be in, uh, entail, um, let's see if I can start that. Our experiments uh, will entail um, uh, babies who are six to eight months old and babies who are ten, six to ten months old. Uh, half of the children will, are, uh, this is ongoing right now, half of the children are exposed to sign language and half are exposed to spoken language. They're hearing exposed to spoken language. We have um, different speeds of uh, visual stimuli that are real signs and we have visual speeds of visual uh, stimuli that are not signs, they're just patterns of light that hit 
the actual frequency that is uh, hypothesized to be at the core of the syllabic unit, around a hertz, a hertz and a half, and then frequencies that are too fast and too slow. The actual strongest prediction comes from the use of uh, the rhythmic frequency that is believed, to, hypothesized to be the closest to the rhythmic nucleus of language, which is about a hertz, a hertz and a half, and we'll test it in, again, stacking the deck against ourselves, we're testing it with rhythmicity that's visual in addition to rhythmicity that's linguistic. So, yes, they may respond to it if it's linguistic, but to really see what the nucle rhythmic nucleus is, we'll be using patterns of lights that have no linguistic content, that are just have the right linguistic temporal frequencies. So um, this would be the most surprising uh, prediction of this to identify the peaked rhythmic frequency that the child's sensitive to. And in combination, the child will be, uh, will have the thermal imaging yoked to this neural imaging system so that we can see when the child is showing attention to the linguistic unit, is the, is the neural tissue that's engaging it the right tissue and not just being analyzed as general visual stimuli or general auditory stimuli? And is the child in a, an especially aroused and peaked uh, attentional state? And if we identify this correspondence, we hope to identify a unit that then could be uh, triggered, used to trigger the robot to begin signing or to stop signing. So w for the first time, approximating contingent social interaction in an artificial agent such as a robot. Okay. Um, uh, Turning now to the thermal imaging, let me just, Professor Merle is here and has been speaking over the last two days. See, there he is. Um, and this, the uh, infrared, thermal infrared imaging is a non-invasive assessment of effective and, and psychophysical and uh, psychophysiological states. Uh, it's an, um, uh, uh, when it's yoked with the near-infrared spectroscopy system, it's uh, a particularly informative uh, uh, set of technology. Um, uh, Professor Merla has established a success with, um, uh, here, let me see if that's on, uh, yes. Um, so the, the thermal imaging reads uh, cutaneous skin temperature variation, which is related uh, uh, fundamentally related to the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. If this is, uh, as I said, it's non-invasive, it's just a camera that's in the direction of the, that's pointed towards the person, and uh, emotional reactions of stress uh, or uh, uh, reactions of calm and attentiveness can be discerned through changes in the uh, skin temperature through uh, very complex mathematical processes. Uh, um, but through this, you can uh, dis differentiate uh, set, uh, states of arousal, uh, states of stress, states of attentiveness, and uh, interest in the material around them. So he has uh, worked on this with adults. He has um, done fascinating studies between, uh, with young children. Uh, this is a young three-month-old baby. He's done uh, children at three years old and older and uh, three months old. And uh, this particular study is about the, um, uh, well, I won't go through the whole, so this is the still face uh, paradigm uh, where mothers are uh, interacting with the baby and then asked to stop and sit with a still face and non-reactive uh, uh, to the child. Uh, there was much controversy in the field as to what happens when a child does this. Is the child distressed when they see this? Or is the child interested in searching the scene, the behavioral data? 
supported both positions, but interestingly the thermal data can adjudicate between these behavioral hypotheses um, with differential temperatures suggesting the types of autonomic nervous system involvement. Um, his group was able to conclude that the young baby in this situation is not distressed and not emotionally uh, um, distressed, but instead in an alert and attentive state recruiting uh, the parasympathetic system as opposed to uh, an alarm uh, system, the sympathetic nervous system. And so, uh, interestingly, as he explained yesterday, the, the um, thermal imaging, dis the, the heat distribution of the mother's face suggests that, in fact, she's the most stressed and not the baby, that the mother has the stress reaction uh, as opposed to uh, the baby. So, um, uh, finally, uh, Professor Merla and his team have extensive experience in integrating FNERS with thermal imaging. And so taken together, this team in their science had already demonstrated various uh, variations in skin temperature and the autonomic nervous system, uh, um, uh, the types of involvement of uh, differential systems within the autonomic nervous system, used technology with babies linking variation and skin temperature and emotions, again involving sympathetic versus parasympathetic systems, laying bare stress reactions versus interest and anticipatory or attention reactions, and had linked the two technologies. But what this team in that individual field had not yet done is to look for the indices of relationship correlations between specific language processing and arousal and attention in young babies. And together with the neuro imaging, we were going to advance uh, trying to explore if there was a systematic relationship, might we then see, might we then be able to use this as an index of a baby's readiness to learn. Um, the second uh, uh, type of information we need was motion capture information. And we needed that to capture the right rhythmicity of sign language, particularly in sign language nursery rhymes. Now many of you have seen this as your nursery rhyme. You have grown up with these, you know, uh, rhythmic, acoustic, auditory, uh, uh, fall rise patterns, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. But if you were exposed to a visual sign language, your exposure would look very different. These are visual rhymes in a silent language. Look at the motion. I won't interpret this into English, but I'll, I'll tell you when the rhymes start. He's still at the descriptive part. Now, these are visual rhymes. The movements rhymes, the hand-shaped rhymes as an alliteration, the selection of the signs are phonetically rhyming because he's selecting so hand shapes that are uh, similar. You, don't, you have a lot of choice in a lexicon. And he's picking signs in which phonetically they rhyme with each other. So this is a rhyme. So how would you study that? It's very complex and lots of movement. Well, the motion capture system allows for the study of this. These motion capture systems are uh, put on deaf signers. And then the deaf signer signs those types of visual rhymes. And then they're reconstructed uh, with avatars to uh, uh, study the movements and understand uh, the temporal distribution. Here's uh, one of the rhymes. This is an avatar that was created from that man with all the lights on his face. And you can see some of the, the rhythmicity of the rhymes. And that rhythmicity allows a child to segment the continuous visual stream. He's talking. OK, that's the end of that. That's an, a classic nursery rhyme in American Sign Language. And one of the things you can see is bark, bark, this is the sign bark, bark, sing, sing, want, want, and he uses a, this phonetic hand shape in like an alliteration in the form of the movements, and then he rhythmically repeats the movements. And that facilitates a child segmenting the visual stream. Okay, so there 
What we had to discover is the rhythmic temporal frequencies with um, myself and Professor Merler to be able to program that into the avatars. The next scientist is Brian Scazzolati, who builds robots. And the, what Brian does is he builds robots that, like, as I said before, are socially assistive. These, particular his area is using robots with autistic children. And a very dramatic finding he has is that robots with very severely uh, autistic children can facilitate the child's social engagement with humans. So the artificial agent, the robot, be, when the child sees it, can facilitate the child's social interaction with humans. And here I'll show you a videotape. This is a, an autistic child who is in a room with a, uh, an exper two experimenters, and a robot's going to be introduced on the table. And watch the child's reaction after the robot comes into Watch the child look to the uh, um, uh, experimenter for social conf confirmation. Uh, there is voice on this. Okay. Okay, so it's sitting in a box somewhere. Okay. What kind of games do you play? Can you hear that? Can I play anything? Like battles. Okay. I'll, I'll show this. Is there any auditory on this? Oh, um, I'm going to let you see this because it's quite dramatic. Um, all right, so what's happening is the child, uh, notice the child's talking but looking away, um, uh, not look, making eye contact with the adult. Yeah, well, now they're gathering dust. I really got to play with them again. Okay, so they're sitting in a box mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. What kind of games do you play? What kind of games do I play with them? Like battles, mini battles. What are you stuck on? Watch his eye gaze. You can do it, come on, Cleo. You can do it. Cross that river, come on. So you see quite an extraordinary impact of this robot on the, on the child's eye gaze from the initial segment where the child's just looking, ta talking, but just looking at the, looking away to uh, a social solicitation during when the robot's there and afterwards uh, making eye contact. Uh, Brian Scazzolati has also yeah, used yeah, robots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oops, uh, has also used robots to teach nutrition to first graders. Oh, so here this is this more face-to-face -face orientation to the interviewer, and more relevant statements to an interviewer's personal story as a result of the intervention with the robot. He's also used it to train nutrition to first graders. Why don't you tell me what we learned last time? Mm. That the wheat bread is healthy and water is healthy too. That's right. I should be eating whole grains and not drinking too much sugar. Okay, and he's also used robots to teach to late learning bilinguals. Okay. Why don't you tell me what we learned last time? Okay, here was an example. Él parece no estar seguro. Tal vez él no sabe cómo hacer una pizza. Le preguntas a Toby si a él le gusta hacer sándwiches. ¿Qué pasa con sándwiches? ¿En inglés? Make a sandwich. So 
here the goal was to help her differentiate the verb English, the English verb make versus the English verb do because that differentiation isn't directly in Spanish. So the use of the robot was to facilitate that. So across these three areas, one with uh, social skill training for autistic children, teaching nutrition to first graders, and teaching English to native uh, Spanish speakers, he's been using robots in a socially uh, um, supportive way. And so he, the problem with the robot, though, is that this is the robots aren't socially contingent. So the robot will start talking to the child if the child's with eye tracking, if the child looks to the direction of the robot and is interested, or if the child looks to the direction of the robot and is not interested. So there was no mechanism within these robots to make them socially contingent. And also the, the robots needed the rhythmic temporal frequencies to be able to differentiate when a child is signing in a way that's linguistic and meaningful versus when it's just moving its hands. So there were roadblocks within that field too. And finally, the last scientist that we pulled into this team is David Trom from the University of California, uh, University of Southern California. Now David's specialty is not just robots, but in particular, robot conversations, robots in an interactive rhythmic conversation with humans. And um, one of his projects, uh, he has, I'll just mention several of the projects that attracted us uh, to, to him. One of his projects is um, the uh, twins in the Boston Museum. Hello. Oh, you get Hello. It. Is there something we can help you with? Who are you? My name's Ada, and I'm Grace. We're your virtual museum guides. With your help, we can suggest exhibits that will get you thinking, or answer questions about things you may have seen here. What do you want to learn about? What can I do here? Here at Computer Place, you can command a robot to do a Mars mission and program another one at Robot Park. You can remote control a robot. Okay, so, I mean, one of the things you see is that um, the, that's the conversation that he's trying to build in, but uh, it's, it's very much a challenge because there's lots of things we do in conversation. It's also a challenge is in looking at the robot, immediately you know it's not human. One of the reasons we know that is because its movements aren't uh, natural and fluid. So an area that we would contribute to this team is the rhythmic nucleus to uh, uh, the algorithm by which they can program into their avatars to make the avatars produce more fluid human-like movements. But I'll just show you uh, another uh, project that, he, that he's doing. This is um, an ex uh, quite a fascinating project. It's to capture testimony of Holocaust survivors who are now in their 80s. And it also incorporates principles of learning. We know that uh, uh, we don't learn passively from just being told a story. We learn if we can interact in conversation. Well, if you have someone who's videotaped, you can't interact with them. But if you recreate the person as an avatar and build in conversational uh, information, you can then begin to interact with the person, and that interaction will facilitate learning. And here's one of the examples from, uh, I just say that this is um, a quite a large project. It's uh, uh, funded by Sp Steven Spielberg, and um, uh, uh, they've accomplished quite a lot. This is a, a blended image. It's uh, both uh, avatar and videotape that's blended. Okay, here's, a, here's a one uh, example of it, of learning in the classroom. My name is Pinhas you can Kuta. Ask a question. I will answer any questions you might have for me. How old were you when the war ended? I was between the ages of 13 and 14 when the war ended in 1945. Do you remember any songs from your youth? This is a lullaby that my mother used to sing to me and I still remember it. It's in Polish. Jaki 
So that's, uh, this is the type of technology that's uh, going to be brought to bear on this. And um, uh, working with our motion caption system, his, uh, David Trom's goal will be to take this information and not simply uh, synthesis, uh, not simply replicate it, but to um, enact movement from, to be able to extract movement out of the visual image and produce it in ways in which it can solve problems like move uh, the hands around. And I'll just give you a sense of one of the, some of the things they do. They have um, motion replication in a virtual environment, but then the goal is to have it solve problems. Uh, this video is not working, but you would see that here it simply walks and moves, and here the object in motion synthesis can walk around this obstruction. And it's uh, so technologically, it's really a hard problem to solve. There are hands that are that get in the way of other hands. You can have the arm of the avatar be cut off and disappear. It has to uh, uh, solve the problem of one hand acting on another. So he has this physical problem to solve. And he also has uh, the temporality to solve. So I'll tell you one other thing. Um, so that's one of the fundamental problems to be solved. And the last one has to do with the verbal inter the interaction of the image with the viewer. And this is an example of something he's already done. These are um, psychotherapists who triage people. Um, and again, you look at the movements and you immediately know it's not human. It's close, but uh, not human. This is a very famous psychotherapist, Ellie. So your husband wants to be warm and fuzzy. Maybe better to the girls. And it feels like you and him both feel a little bit like you're a little bit distant compared to maybe how you used to be in the past. Mm -hmm. Is there anything then, besides what he wants, anything that you want to work on? Anything that you feel like we could use this time? So you can see the movements are quite stiff. So there's going to be um, very much an advance of that field because of the uh, advent of the temporal, fr the temporal frequencies that are at the nucleus of human language and uh, n human movement through the analysis uh, that we're doing on mocap. So taken together, we hope that the fruits of this uh, uh, will um, accomplish a variety of things in basic science, technology, and in uh, application. Um, uh, we uh, hope to discover the universals, uh, uh, the rhythmic temporal universals at the nucleus of natural language. We hope to find a marriage between the child's peak sensitivity to those universals and peaked arousal and attention and their uh, and together providing an index of when young children are uh, ready to learn uh, this we hope to interface all this information in uh, socially interactive robots that produce contingent language samples that respond when a child's interested turn away when the child's not solicit attention when the child disengages and approximates a contingent interaction, and also uh, to advance a human, um, virtual human dialogue, because as we turn to a future, the reliance on uh, uh, interactive technology and iPads in the home are going to be increased, and we'd like uh, to add new information to that. So we hope to advance new knowledge of the human learning potential, uh, uh, each individual field to solve previously insoluble problems in each science, uh, to create a new interdisciplinary science discipline uh, involving intelligent agents, intelligent human agents, and interaction between machines and humans, um, uh, to contribute to the uh, competitive science and technology advances with, uh, which have economic impact at the level of a nation. It's not our interest, but it's certainly uh, has a cascading impact. And with regard to meaningful translation, we're hoping that these devices, uh, or once uh, delivered, can have a transformative uh, impact, uh, potentially reach vast numbers of children uh, who are suffering from the de devastating impact of minimal language input. And so I thank you.
thank you so thank you so very much it's been a wonderful experience just to be in the audience and seeing all these things building up i remember last night we had another public lecture where we were t debating about creativity and we were saying okay so this remix and sort of copying and and putting things together yeah. well i see this here because you have all these fascinating developments but what is even more sort of impactful is how you put these different pieces together with i would say the most fascinating thing and most impressive thing for me is the goal the vision the vision of putting the science of learning and the science of um and the technology yeah. of putting the, the the what humans do and then the best of that into the robot and interacting and this it's it's also I do, I need to understand how these robots actually can make the autistic child to begin to interact with humans. I mean, what's happening yeah. there is is so fascinating. So. Thank you so very much. And I'm very much aware that we do have also, uh, th so this is now question answer time and also, um, you know, comments, um, discussions. And we have our colleagues from UCL there. Right. Okay. So maybe um, I will start with any questions from here first, and then we'll then um, see what we have um, from our colleagues at UCL. Any questions, comments? Um, actually, can I start with one question first? It's really the, the opt I mean, I don't know whether you've done anything on the aut autistic child. I mean, why, I mean, you had these, um, now you show us several um,